So today uh, we will be uh, taking uh, a sutta which is kind of a popular sutta in uh, Buddhist circles. It is advice for the lay people. It is uh, advice on what are what is the blessing. So this is from Sutta Nipata, which I had taken uh, previously also. It is one of the oldest collection of suttas of the Buddha. Uh, suttas itself are considered to be uh, uh, the old, old teachings or uh, the uh, original teachings of the Buddha. And in that also Sutta Nipata is considered to be the older uh, of the collections. In the lifetime of Buddha also, uh, this collection of teachings were referred uh, and uh, 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 the monks who had uh, memorized them were praised, saying that uh, this monk is uh, has good memory, he has uh, memorized the Sutta Nipata. So this is a uh, teachings of the Buddha and it is about the uh, blessings. Uh, the name is Mahamangala Sutta. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Savadi in Jetha's grove, Anatha Pindika's park. Then when the night had advanced, a certain deity of stunning beauty, having illuminated the entire Jetha's grove, approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, stood to one side and addressed the Blessed One in verse. So now uh, uh, the Buddha uh, is considered to be uh, the teacher of men and devas. So, uh, certain times in many of the suttas, there is a clear mention of devas coming and asking the Buddha questions, uh, sometimes uh, advice. So, uh, this is uh, one of the instances where a deva comes, uh, a being who is in uh, living in the heaven realms has come. And one of the uh, uh, lines over here mentioned is that having illuminated the entire jethas group, so this illumination is through the psychic energy of the deva, the, the glow the deva uh, has. Uh, through that glow, the whole of the, uh, the, uh, the jetha's grove uh, has been uh, illuminated. But in uh, Buddhist circles, you can see the same thing uh, uh, that uh, when uh, deities come to the temple, they have lamps and they uh, light the lamps as a symbol or as a uh, offering to the Buddha. So this is a, a tradition which is uh, of giving light as a uh, dana. And the Buddha has also mentioned that one of the danas which you give is of light because most probably they stayed in forest and they had need for candles and lamps. So that may be the reason uh, that uh, tradition is there. Many devas and human beings have reflected on blessings, longing for safety, so declare the highest blessing. So it's a simple question that what is the blessings and what is the highest blessing? Maha Mangala means uh, uh, this is the uh, highest blessing uh, the, uh, the Deva is asking about. So the Buddha gives the first ex, uh, uh, the advice, not associating with fools, associating with the wise. So uh, when you are uh, having a, uh, uh, a choice for a friend, then the, uh, the friend should be of the uh, wise uh, person, not a foolish person. And the wisdom is mentioned in our uh, tradition as somebody who knows about the Dhamma or about the dependent origination. When a person has a knowledge of dependent origination, he has the knowledge of the true uh, teachings. And one of the ways uh, a person starts on the journey uh, on the uh, Dhamma is by associating with wise people. When he associates with white people, he hears the Dhamma. When he hears the Dhamma, he gets inspiration. When he gets inspiration, he does practice. And then he progresses. In the same way, uh, the journey starts uh, uh, in this life, uh, which is ending of ignorance. It starts with associating with uh, wise people. So that is the first advice. And venerating those worthy of veneration, this is the highest blessing. So when you are uh, giving respect, to give respect to the people who are uh, worthy. So who, who are, those are monks are there. If there are uh, learned people, those people you uh, give uh, your uh, respect. Residing in a suitable place, merit done in the past and directing oneself, uh, oneself rightly, 
this is the highest blessing. Reside in a suitable place is that you are there or staying in a place where it is safe and it is conducive to your practice. Other is uh, the suitable place for your uh, karmic level of uh, return. So, so if uh, a person uh, has uh, done good, he has done uh, dana, he has kept the shila, so then he is bound to be reborn in a uh, heavenly realm. So that is a suitable place for him when he goes uh, from the earth realm to the uh, uh, heaven, uh, the next uh, birth. Then it will be based on the suitable uh, place of birth, will be based on his karmic uh, uh, earnings, what, which he has done in the lifetime. So that is what uh, this also uh, means. They have two meanings. One is that when, uh, one, you stay in a place which is uh, peaceful and conducive to, to your life. And the other is that you uh, stay in a place where it is uh, equivalent to the merits you have earned. Merit done in the past and directing oneself rightly. The uh, directing of oneself rightly is dana, sila and bhavana. Dana is the uh, generosity. Sila is the uh, good conduct. And the bhavana is uh, developing of your faculty. So, uh, so developing of your mind. So that is done through the practice. Uh, what we teach about a twin or six hour right effort. The, uh, if you are practicing, then you are also practicing the uh, right practice. So, uh, and you are developing your mind. So you have to uh, first reside in a suitable place, merit done in the past and directing oneself rightly. This is the highest blessing. Then the next advice is much learning, a craft, a well-trained disciple and well-spoken speech, this is the highest blessings. So uh, the Buddha praises uh, that uh, one should be uh, uh, learning uh, in the life. And this learning can be based on who uh, or wh what you are doing in your life currently. Say like uh, a monk has to learn about uh, certain things which is of practice, like meditation is there, uh, uh, memorizing suttas are there, chanting is there. But he also has some responsibilities. So he has to learn about those responsibilities like uh, sweeping, uh, uh, maintaining his uh, residence. So those kind of skills are praised by the Buddha. So, and uh, in a certain uh, monastery, they have uh, uh, skills uh, which are there, which are very highly uh, uh, kind of sought after, like uh, making tooth uh, picks uh, or uh, toothbrushes out of uh, soft wood. Because uh, the higher monks, uh, they, they, they are unable to do that. Uh, it is a skillful work. It has a lot of uh, kind of effort is required to make those toothpicks. Uh, Vinaya requirement is that when you have finished your meal, you clean your teeth to maintain hygiene. So toothpicks or a soft uh, wood brushes are made. So those are the skills a monk learns. And in life also, when you are uh, in the house, so you ne uh, need to know the skills which are like uh, if uh, there is a, a plumbing uh, issue in the house. So you may, you should be able to kind of fix that that thing. Or if the light goes, uh, you uh, are able to kind of uh, remove and uh, replace the bulbs. So those kinds of skills are to be learned because those are the skills which will help you in life. It will kind of smoothen out your day-to-day uh, -day life. So that is also a blessing. So you have to have much learning and a craft. That is a skill you should develop. A, a well-trained disciple. So uh, uh, when uh, you are de developing a craft or a skill and you are able to uh, kind of do whatever is required in your job or in your life uh, or in your uh, residence, then uh, you are not dependent on others and you can have a good life. So that this is also considered the highest blessing. And uh, uh, well-spoken speech. Now, in uh, speech, uh, there are uh, four aspects. One is the aspect of uh, not to lie. Uh, another is not to uh, use uh, harsh words, cursing, uh, 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 not to have idle speech, that is uh, speaking uh, aimlessly <clears throat> or without any purpose, and uh, not to have uh, a speech which is uh, 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 conducive to uh, kind of uh, getting two groups into a fight. Don't go to one group and say uh, one thing which will make the uh, uh, one group a fight with the other group. So you should not do uh, the, uh, the slander. So th those four things are uh, part of the 
right speech. This is a part of the uh, our precepts also. So that is the highest blessing. The next is serving one's mother and father, maintaining a wife and children, and an honest occupation. This is the highest blessings. So the Buddha says that one ha has to uh, serve the mother and father. And one of the basic uh, tenets is that uh, the uh, 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 what you owe to your mother and father is so much that even if you were to take care of your mother and father for a hundred years, and you have to take them on, a, on your, their shoulder and go around the whole of the world uh, walking for a hundred years, you will not be able to repay uh, the uh, uh, debt you own to your mother and father because without them, you would not be uh, born as a human uh, being. So as you are born, uh, the, the, the highest uh, 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 responsibility for your taking care and as, as you are a kid uh, to make you... Uh, uh, give you food, uh, protect you, uh, uh, clothe you, and uh, make you uh, means uh, give you education. All these things the mother and father uh, do, and by doing that, they kind of uh, have uh, uh, accumulated such a kind of debt to you that uh, the uh, uh, working for them for a hundred years also does not repay. One way of repaying the debt of mother and father is to uh, get them to dhamma. So one of the things in Thailand the monks do is that they uh, ordain their mother or father after they have been ordained uh, as a monk. They also ordain once uh, in the lifetime uh, uh, their mother or father to gain the merit, to kind of uh, uh, having brought them to the Dhamma. They also kind of uh, ordain once before the marriage. Because they have the uh, uh, superstition that if you were destined to be a monk, and uh, by mistake, you go into a uh, married life, then you are kind of uh, wasting your life. So uh, there are instances where there were uh, uh, senior monks who kind of uh, uh, ordained for just one day, uh, just for the sake of uh, before marriage as a custom. And they did not even uh, think of becoming a monk. But the day they ordained, they kind of changed. And they said that it is like that I cannot remove this uh, uh, robe. Uh, that is the feeling that Bhante Vimakransi also had when he had ordained that he will not be able to kind of uh, disrobe uh, uh, in this lifetime. That is a feeling uh, the, the monk got and then uh, later on he became a big monk. Uh, he was also considered a arhan. So that, that is a tradition. So one way of uh, kind of repaying is to getting your uh, uh, mother and father into uh, the uh, light of the thumb. So, and maintaining a wife and children. So, when you are a lay person, you have a wife, you have a children, and you have to take care of that. And uh, many suttas, uh, the Buddha says that how you take care of the uh, people. So, first is mother and father, then your uh, wife, children, then your uh, uh, whatever people who are uh, your employees. You take care of them, then your relatives who are uh, uh, your relatives also, you have to take care of them. Then you have to take care of the local area. Uh, if there is a, a local area a hall is there or a, a committee is there or a, a local area, there are some charitable uh, institutions are there, you uh, uh, support them. Then you uh, also give your taxes. Then you uh, do uh, uh, charity on a larger scale if uh, possible. So uh, uh, first uh, priority is mother and father, then your uh, wife and children. So those are the things if you are taking care of. And the uh, thing is an honest occupation. The honest occupation is their uh, requirement for the, uh, the Buddha. But there are certain occupations which are considered uh, not to be a kind of conducive for a, Buddha, uh, a person who is following the Buddha's teaching. One is uh, 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 dealing in poisons, dealing in weapons, dealing in slaves, uh, dealing in uh, livestock. So there are certain uh, things uh, uh, one is not allowed, but other uh, professions where you are trading or uh, you are farming uh, or you are uh, exchanging your skill for money, those things are allowed. So one who has the uh, honest and uh, occupation has a blessing, which is the highest blessing. Giving the righteous conduct, giving and righteous conduct, that would be dana and shila assistance to relatives, blameless deeds. This is the highest blessings. 
So you give, uh, you ha have a generosity and you also keep your righteous conduct, which is Shila. So in one of the sutta, the Buddha says that when a person uh, has a generosity, uh, he has certain merits he uh, earns, but he also should have uh, the uh, Shila, which is the right conduct. So one example the Buddha gives is if one is generous, he will get a, a, a good birth and uh, he is also righteous. So he'll get a heavenly birth. But say if he is not uh, uh, keeping his shila, but he is generous and he is giving uh, uh, dana. Uh, so if he is reborn, he may be reborn in an animal uh, world. He may be reborn as a horse. He may be reborn as a dog. He may be reborn as a cat. Because uh, he has done a generosity, he will be born in a place where he is taken care of. So uh, uh, if he is born as a host, he will be born in a royal stable. So he is taken care of, uh, he is fed, he is cleaned, he is massaged. So the horse uh, who are there in a stable have a very good life. They don't have a danger of getting eaten. They don't get, have a danger of uh, starving. So because uh, a, a, a person has been generous, then he gets that uh, thing uh, 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 as being born in a royal uh, stable. In uh, this life also, you can see that there are many dogs and cats which are there in very good homes. They are get protected, they are fed, they are loved. So those uh, uh, beings may be at one time generous, but not keeping their shila. So both are uh, required. You should be generous, but you should also keep your uh, precepts, five precepts which are given those are to be kept. So both are uh, in combination gives you uh, a guaranteed uh, good birth in the next life. And if you also have a, a bhavana, that is the meditation, then uh, you are considered to be a, 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 a dhamma follower. And dhamma follower has a very high likelihood of becoming a sotapanna before the uh, this life ends. So there can be a faith follower or a dhamma follower. Those have a high likelihood of becoming a sotapanna. So there is a kind of discussion uh, in uh, academic circles about this. But uh, many of the places uh, it has been uh, kind of uh, said that if you keep your precepts, <coughs> sorry, if you keep your precepts and uh, uh, contemplate on the dhamma, then you uh, can consider yourself a sotapanna. So this is uh, in line with the other suttas also. So that is uh, also your highest blessing. And you give assistance to your relatives and blameless deeds. Means you don't uh, uh, or don't take lives or anything like that. That is the blameless deeds you do. And you also help your relatives. So that uh, is also a blessing. Desisting and abstaining from evil. Refraining from intoxicating drink. Heedfulness in good qualities. So uh, one does not uh, have intoxicating drinks uh, is a way of uh, saying that one can refrain and can uh, desist and abstain from evil uh, deeds. The, the, one of the examples that gives that one who drinks uh, uh, can go into gambling. When, when he goes into gambling, he will lose his wealth, he loses his reput reputation, and then it will be a miserable situation when uh, comes. There's one story uh, which is not related to the Buddhist story, but uh, it, is, it kind of uh, exemplifies the uh, intoxicants, how it helps uh, or how it helps in your downfall. One of uh, a, a very a wealthy merchant was there. He was uh, kind of very uh, kind and uh, uh, loving to his wife. And then he had a servant. He was very, uh, the servant was very loyal to the master because he, the, he used to take care of the servant. And he uh, used to be uh, of a uh, very good uh, reputation. So uh, once uh, uh, the devil comes to him, the Mara comes to him and says that uh, I will give you the riches. I will make you the king of the uh, land. You are rich, but you don't have power. I will give you the, uh, the kingdom and I will give you power, but you have to uh, 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 beat your wife. So uh, he says that I cannot beat my wife. I, I love my wife a lot. He said, okay, then uh, kill your servant. So he said, no, I cannot kill my servant. He is uh, like my son, you know. I cannot kill my servant because uh, I uh, love him uh, uh, like my son. So he said, okay, then just do one thing. Just drink a little bit of uh, liquor for me. 
So I'll give you a bottle of liquor. You just drink that. So he said, it is a very kind of bargain uh, for me. You know, I can drink some liquor and I can become the king. Uh, and I can have uh, power. I have all the money in the world, but I can also have power. So uh, in this greed, uh, he uh, starts drinking uh, the liquor. And when he becomes intoxicated, his wife uh, comes uh, and says that, why are you drinking uh, liquor? And uh, he becomes angry with the wife because he, she's, try, he's, try, she's trying to stop him. And then she starts beating his wife. When he starts beating his wife, his servants uh, uh, hears it and comes and tries to kind of uh, pursue his ma master not to beat the, uh, uh, the lady of the house, you know. So uh, then he becomes so angry that why are you coming between me and your, my wife? And he's intoxicated. So he uh, takes the bottle and starts beating the servants and kills the servants. So in this way, the devil gets uh, all his wishes. Uh, so it starts with your mind not being in your uh, control. So that is the reason intoxicants are kind of prohibited uh, because uh, once one uh, uh, is intoxicated, uh, one does not know how to behave. So, but in uh, Buddha's uh, teaching, uh, they, they are uh, not dogmatic. So the Buddha is allowing uh, if the intoxicants is in a medicine. So if there is a cough medicine and it has alcohol, there is no reason to kind of uh, avoid that. If a food item has uh, alcohol, and uh, it is just for a flavoring, like a rum cake is there, or uh, there are uh, French cookings where wine is used. It all burns up while cooking, you know. And it, uh, the one way of uh, kind of finding out which is uh, allowable and which is not allowable is uh, for a lay person. For a monk, uh, it's very difficult. But for a lay person, say, if uh, you have a food item like a rum uh, chocolate, and you have uh, too many, you get intoxicated. So then you should avoid those things. And if you have something like a rum cake, you can eat a lot of rum cake, but you will not be, be intoxicated because that rum has uh, evaporated in the process of cooking. So it has just flavor. So in this way, uh, uh, Buddha's teaching is also there, which is pragmatic and practical. So intoxication has to be avoided. And if the alcohol is there in medicine or food in a reasonable quantity, that is not a problem. So uh, that is uh, what uh, the Buddha is saying, desisting and abstaining from evil, refraining from intoxicating drink, heedfulness in good qualities. This is the highest blessing. Reverence and humility. So you should have uh, humility and you should also uh, kind of give respect where respect is due. Contentment and gratitude. So you should be content with what you have and you should be grateful for what you have. So the gratefulness as a practice itself is very popular in these days. Many uh, have seen that uh, just being grateful can be kind of uh, uh, life changing. Like one of the practices one uh, uh, person was to say was that he uh, took a stone. Okay. Uh, he was a, I think, a Christian uh, in a uh, African uh, uh, church and he wanted to raise money. So he said that, what should I do? So I don't have anything. Uh, so he wanted to uh, do something uh, which was positive. So he said that I'll take this stone and I'll call it a gratitude stone. So whenever I touch this stone, I'll be grateful for something in life. So uh, he kept that stone in the pocket and whenever he used to kind of uh, empty his pocket in the evening, he uh, remembered I had to be grateful for something. When he goes to office, he takes the, uh, his uh, things and he touches the stone. He remembers that I have to uh, be grateful for something. So in the day also, if he has to uh, touch the stone, he will be uh, remembering something to be grateful. Then he said he had an idea that I will be grateful. I will sell this stone as gratitude stone. And then he uh, uh, raised enough money to kind of build his church. So in this way, the gratitude itself uh, being gr uh, grateful has a uh, very kind of powerful state of mind. Uh, the other uh, aspect of uh, being respectful is that if you are uh, respectful, uh, the Buddha says that uh, one who is respectful in this life, when he's reborn again as a human being, he is beautiful. But if you, one is disrespectful, he, one is born as ugly. So uh, uh, respect also has uh, the uh, effect in the life of the uh, uh, people. So reverence and humility, contentment and gratitude, timely listening to the Dhamma. This is the highest blessing. So you also listen to the Dhamma in the timing, like this, uh, Wednesday and uh, Sundays, we have this uh, 
uh, Zoom meetings uh, and when you listen to them, you have certain uh, uh, things which goes on in the mind. So certain uh, ideas uh, are implanted in your mind, certain uh, perspectives uh, you are learning. So in this way, uh, you have to timely listen to the Dhamma. Patience and being amiable to advice. You should be patient. Uh, uh, Bhante Vimalamsi says that uh, patience leads to Nibbana. This teacher used to tell him because uh, he used to kind of uh, uh, have a lot of uh, questions and he used to, to be kind of impatient. So the, uh, uh, Bhante Vimalamsi's teacher used to say uh, to him that uh, patience, uh, be patient, uh, patience will lead to Lipana. So one should be patient and be amiable to advise. So if somebody is a kind of pointing out certain things in the life, then uh, that uh, thing uh, you have to be kind of uh, aware that uh, somebody is kind of trying to point out certain things and maybe there is certain uh, things which is uh, beneficial for me. So you should be uh, open to advice. So uh, that is also a blessing and seeing of ascetics, timely discussion on the Dhamma. So you uh, see ascetics or meet ascetics in a timely manner and also discuss the Dhamma. So that is also a uh, blessings. So if you have an opportunity uh, uh, to meet a certain ascetics, then it kind of helps you uh, gain insight and it helps you kind of uh, understand the Dhamma. If you have questions, you can clarify your questions. So those are the things you will be able to do. Austerity and spiritual life, seeing the noble truths. So one, uh, this is in higher practice as uh, progressively, this is uh, uh, giving advice which are higher uh, uh, practice advice that is austerity and uh, spiritual life, seeing the noble truths and realization of Nibbana. This is the highest uh, blessing. So one uh, who is following the path of the uh, spiritual path, then uh, he can uh, he can uh, have an astral life and spiritual life, seeing the noble truths and realization of the nibbana. Because when uh, uh, you re realize nibbana, you are uh, free from all your uh, uh, dukkha. So uh, that is the uh, highest blessing. One whose mind does not shake when touched by worldly conditions, sorrowless, dust free, secure. This is the highest blessing. So this is also a, a one way of stay, uh, say, uh, kind of uh, explaining the state of Nibbana. So the state of Nibbana is one whose mind does not shake when touched by worldly conditions. So whatever happens, uh, good happens, bad happens, the one, one does not get kind of uh, 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 worried if something bad happens, one does not get elated when if something good happens. So his mind is balanced. It's in equanimity always. Sorrowless, dust-free, secure, this is the highest blessing. So sorrowless means they don't have any dukkha. They may have pain, but they may not have dukkha. So like uh, Buddha also uh, in his last days had a lot of pain, uh, illnesses, but uh, his mind was always pure and he did not have uh, the condition of dukkha in the mind. Dust-free, is also said to be uh, a way of saying that uh, one does not have wrong views. So that are obscuring your uh, seeing of the world. So that is dust has been used many times uh, in the teachings to uh, say that one who has a lot of dust cannot see what is being taught also, which is being uh, explained because his perspective is not clear. So he is not uh, clear about what is happening. And this is the highest blessing. Those who have done these things are victorious everywhere. Everywhere they go safely. Theirs is the highest blessing. So one who has attained Nibbana, one who has done good things, they are considered victorious everywhere. Everywhere they go safely. Theirs is the highest blessing. So this is the teaching of the Buddha, uh, which starts off with uh, uh, practical aspects and goes till the uh, training of Nibbana. So this is the way uh, progressively the training and uh, the advice uh, is given to the lay people that they start training and they do good things and uh, ultimately lead to the ultimate goal. So uh, that is the uh, sutta end. And if there are any questions, I'll be open to questions.
yes. <laughs> ah, hello, Van uh, Thank you. Thank you for that uh, uh, talk. I'm just uh, bringing up the sutta on the uh, side. Um, I, I was following, and you, I, I missed the points that you were making around austerity and celibacy. I didn't quite... Uh, so so that, uh, that are uh, for a higher training. So what mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, saying is... Uh, uh, that uh, when uh, when a person kind of uh, slowly progresses in his teach uh, teaching, mm -hmm. then austerity and the spiritual life uh, uh, comes up. So now uh, you uh, kind of see uh, this. Uh, I'll read it once again: austerity, austerity, and the spiritual life. Seeing the noble truths and realization of nibbana, this is the highest blessing. So now uh, okay. the Buddha is talking about the ultimate goal. So the Buddha always goes from the uh, mundane to the super mundane. So okay. uh, he uh, talked about the practical aspects and then now he is talking about the highest aspect. So these three uh, uh, sections are there uh, which is uh, mm -hmm. talking about Nibbana. Then how the Nibbana state is there and how it is affecting you. So those three things are uh, explained. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. And by the way, uh, Sister Kema kind of uh, uh, was out. Uh, uh, I just got a message from uh, uh, one of the people who take care of her, her that uh, she thought it was five o'clock. Uh, so she she's out. <laughs> uh, she had to buy something. So she, she went out and I think she got uh, confused. I had spoken to her, I had sent her a message, but I think uh, she was out already. <laughs> Anyways, is there any other questions? Yeah. Hello. I uh, I haven't properly formed my question, uh, so this this is a bit tricky. But I wanted to ask you if you could say something about um, dynamics in families and about providing support um, where. Where the where the the family dynamic is such that support isn't wanted or is rejected, um, or there are very difficult, uh, uh, I suppose, manifestations, whether they're speech or behaviour, where you might want to be helping, but but really, it's very difficult to find a way to to give it because it's very rejected or there's a lot of yeah there's a lot of difficult energy around around that and and how might you best guide yourself before you're completely um at ease in your own mind with what's <laughs> coming towards you because you haven't completely transcended so there's an aspect of you need to take care of yourself so you don't take it on board and take it personally but also you you're left with an inability to support. Um, so uh, yeah. the Buddha <laughs> kind of kind of gives two uh, kind of aspects or uh, perspectives on this. Uh, one is that uh, one should be uh, open to helping. That does not uh, mean that one is obligated to help or one should uh, kind of uh, uh, hurt oneself uh, to help others. So uh, preserving oneself or uh, kind of uh, being uh, kind to oneself is the start of the uh, journey. Okay, so one cannot say that uh, I will hurt myself to kind of help others. And other thing about relatives, uh, the Buddha is saying is one of the uh, Dhammapada verses is also there that uh, you think that uh, this is my wealth, this is my uh, 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 wife, this is my son, but you are not yourselves. Means you don't own yourself. But you are uh, showing ownership over your wealth, your uh, wife, your son. But how can you own them when you are unable to own yourself? So uh, Buddha says that the journey of uh, owning oneself, that is understanding oneself, is uh, to be taken uh, uh, paramount. Okay, And you don't own the, the, the uh, means it is you in uh, speech you say this is my son. This is my wife. This is my car. This is my house. So one of the uh, story is uh, 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 Osho uh, used to say, uh, means one of the story he said was that there is a king uh, who is there on the throne and an ascetic comes. So uh, there is a Sufi uh, who comes uh, to the king 
and says uh, to the king, who are you? Uh, he, the king is very surprised that the Sufi is asking uh, that I am the king, I am the uh, owner of this palace. Uh, why are you wandering around? Uh, the, he asked the ascetics. But uh, he says that uh, if you are the owner, I came some uh, years before. The, uh, some other person was uh, said he is the owner of this uh, palace. He said, oh, he is my father. I came some other, uh, some more years before and some other person was said this. So he, that was my grandfather. So he says that next time I come, you will not be here. So he said, yes, my son will be there. So he said, how is this your palace? That before uh, this was not yours, and sometime after this will not be yours. But there is an ownership we uh, kind of have on those things. So uh, we have to understand that uh, each of your relative or uh, the family member is also an individual and independent. And he, they also have their own karmic uh, uh, path which they are traveling. So you have to give them freedom in that sense. That you have to give them freedom to kind of make mistakes of their own learn from their mistakes and be responsible for the uh, actions they are taking. So uh, you have to have that independence of uh, karma, karma and understanding that how one action leads to one's uh, uh, kind of reactions. So the what is there in the present leads to what uh, uh, happens in the future. So what is happening in the present in the uh, is also dependent on what has happened in the past. So it is dependent on what has happened in the past, what you have done in the present. So all those things are uh, a combination of what will lead to you, your actions now and what will uh, have the future consequences. So uh, you have to be able to give freedom to uh, your relatives and understand that they are also independent beings having the independent journeys. And those journey path kind of uh, have uh, kind of collided. So say there is a relative, there is a uh, aunt or a, a uncle. Uh, at one point of time, you were the, their aunt or uncle and they were the, your niece or something like that. And sometimes you may be uh, their uh, parent and sometimes they may have been your parent. So you have to understand that in this long journey, everybody has played the role of uh, a parent. So uh, Buddha says that it is very unlikely that you meet anybody in, your, in this lifetime and they have not been your parents at some point in the past. So the, uh, you have to understand this is just uh, the present which is there and this is the present situation. These situations have gone through uh, many times in the past. So you have to give freedom and be uh, a, available not saying that you have to intervene, but being available uh, for uh, anybody who needs your help when they, they approach or uh, they have uh, come to you, then you are available to kind of help, advise uh, and kind of guide them. But you should not take up responsibility for others because you have responsibility only for yourself. So you are responsible for your understanding of how your mind is functioning how you are creating your dukkhas, how you are taking it personally, things. So when you are understanding yourself, you have uh, developing your wisdom. When you are developing your wisdom, you will be able to take actions which are there. Yes, Sane? You will be able to take actions uh, which are uh, kind of in line with the Dhamma. When you are taking actions in line with the Dhamma, then you will create good uh, kind of results. So this is a cycle. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, those comments are very useful, uh, Bhante. Um, would you extend those um, to include parents, which you indicated uh, we have an especial debt to, and you know, however burdensome uh, or troublesome the support uh, or um, that process is, or how rejecting, we still have an obligation uh, to help them. Or do we just recognize that help is being rejected, or uh, the generosity isn't recognized, and that that's the best we can do? Yeah, see, in the sense that uh, your parents are also independent people, okay? 
So if uh, a help is being offered, that is your uh, kind of duty. Uh, to reject is their uh, kind of uh, 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 right to reject also. So because they are on their journey and they uh, are re refusing your uh, help. So you should uh, kind of give them space. Giving them a space is also a kind of a way of helping them. Uh, kind of uh, they uh, they uh, uh, they want to do certain things. Uh, you may think that oh this may be risky. They are going uh, to kind of buy a, a second house or something like that. You show this seems very risky financially, but you can give them advice. But they may say no. We are going to do it. So then you have are uh, supposed to give them the space to kind of uh, act in their uh, own uh, kind of wisdom. So this may be uh, kind of hurt hurting them. But it is their own independence, which is to be recognized also. So uh, it is always a balance between those things, you know, the independence of each individual and uh, the willingness to uh, kind of provide our uh, help and assistance. So it is al always a kind of a, a balancing act. Yeah, thank you. it certainly is. Thank you very much, Fante. <laughs> is there anything else? I just said thank you. It was super helpful. Sad. <laughs> okay, then if there are no other questions, is there any other question from any other? Yes, yes, Kira. Uh, Namo Buddha, Bante. Uh, I want to ask. Uh, I'm afraid that I'm wasting my my time here in this lifetime. So, uh, if I want to born again, I mean, like. If ever I born again as a human being in the next life, is there any way for me to create that condition that I will know this twin method in the next life? See, one thing is that uh, we are uh, kind of very uh, poor at uh, determining what is happening currently because it is also from our perspective. So what perspective we have developed. Uh, so we are unable to judge if we are wasting our time or if this is kind of fruitful or this is hurting us. So because of that, the Buddha's teaching kind of becomes a guide uh, for us to uh, kind of uh, uh, analyze what we are doing. So the Buddha is giving a very uh, simple teaching. He says that the whole teaching can be uh, summarized into three things, which is uh, doing good, avoiding evil, and developing your mind. So doing good means being generous. Generous can be meaning that uh, smiling. Uh, when you are going out, you smile at some people. Uh, who are there uh, uh, and being kind of kind to others. So that can be a simple generosity. Then uh, uh, keeping the Sheila is uh, the five precepts. You just keep those five precepts as uh, closely as possible. And following the Dhamma uh, or practice can be mean, uh, just can mean that you contemplate on the uh, Itipiso. That is the char good characteristics of the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. So that can be the minimum you can do as an obligation for uh, your lifetime. If you do this, then uh, Buddha says that you will not see an eighth life. However heedless you are, you will not be able to see the eighth life because uh, uh, when you are inclining your mind towards the good and then you are uh, kind of uh, on the top of it, you are uh, learning about the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. Then what happens is, your mind inclines towards the good aspects and inclines towards the dhamma. And uh, this leads to a chain reaction, which kind of ends up uh, in uh, one becoming a uh, sotapanna in this lifetime. And then uh, in the uh, subsequent lifetime, uh, becoming uh, a, a, a kind of an arahant or uh, getting off the wheel of the samsara. As far as the current, uh, or if you want to kind of have a next life as a human being, and you have an aspiration for something. One thing uh, you have to remember is that uh, once you are doing good things, one is generosity, second is uh, keeping the shila. What you direct your mind towards, that uh, you can go. So if you have enough merits, you have uh, accumulated. So wherever you direct your mind towards, there you will be able to go. So one of the uh, 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 time the Buddha, there are two ascetics who came to the Buddha. One was a dog ascetic. He lived at, like a dog. He barked and uh, ate food uh, out of the ground. One uh, was uh, living as a cow ascetic. So he uh, stay, uh, 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 roamed around and ate grass. So 
and they lived as a dog and a cow and they wanted to know from the buddha what is their next lifetime so the buddha uh, say, uh, because the ascetics had a good shila because they did not do anything wrong they did not have any kind of they did not kill they did not uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, steal and other things so uh, the buddha said that i will not tell you uh, what is your next life they asked for three times after that uh, the buddha kind of uh, 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 realized that they will be hurt but he cannot refuse now so he told them that the cow ascetic he told that next life will be born as a cow and the dog ascetic he said he will be born as a dog because they are inclining their mind towards that lifetime the uh, dog ascetic is inclining himself towards a dog life and a cow ascetic is inclining towards a cow life so that is how the uh, the person is kind of born in uh, modern times if you want to uh, see that uh, uh, we uh, uh, native americans they kind of aspire to become uh, certain animals like a reborn as a eagle they aspire to be reborn as a jackal or a fox or something like that so they have their own uh, reason, reasons behind it but because they uh, live a life which is a uh, kind of a uh, uh, good shila they live so they can achieve that life but that is not uh, uh, the life the buddha is advising it is uh, buddha advises that you should uh, aspire for your life to have understanding develop your wisdom so that if you are doing that then uh, uh, if you are uh, keeping your uh, uh, shila you are uh, having generosity and uh, following the uh, kind of uh, dhamma path then you can incline your mind uh, wherever you want and then that mind uh, will take you in that direction so it is if it is about re being reborn uh, in the human life then uh, you will be getting a life which is uh, uh, a human life next time. but that also means that uh, this can also uh, have a negative inclin inclinations also like uh, one uh, 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 can be uh, reborn in a deva loka in the next seven lifetimes you may be an arahant and uh, kind of uh, be uh, rid of this samsara you know but if you are kind of aspiring to become a, a, a reborn as a human being then what may happen is that even if you have have achieved the uh, sotapanna you will not be going beyond a uh, sakdagami as a sakdagami you will come back once again in this lifetime but you had the parmis or you had de developed your mind to kind of go to an uh, anagami but that that time it will get stopped because you have aimed yourself uh, to be reborn so uh, one should aim for wisdom you get this point <laughs> yeah go, i got it i got it it seems like uh, starting from zero again but still uh, have like parami in the past but i got it yeah <laughs> i have another question ban yes uh i just want to get confirmation here uh like there was a case uh there um like like my partner's grandma uh was in the hospital before with the medical devices and uh his family just want to unplug but i told them that uh it's not good to unplug the medical devices so it means like once you unplug it means you kill her Uh, I just want to get confirmation. Is that true or they uh, are? I will tell you about a, a monk who had the same thing. Uh, I had mentioned this monk in the, my teaching uh, just now uh, that uh, the, he was considered an arahant. Okay, one of his uh, friends who was a senior monk was on a life uh, support machine, and they said uh, the, the doctors told them that he is kind of brain dead, uh, and the life support machine uh, he is only based on the machine he is uh, living. so uh, the monk decided that uh, we can switch off the machine because we are not killing him uh, our aim is not to kill uh, and the the action has not been taken or the instruction has not been given uh, with the uh, intention of being killing uh, the intention he expressed was let him live as long his as his body will support him with the intention that he may live as long as he uh, his body will support his life by that uh, intention they kind of switched off that machine he lived for i think 2 minutes uh, after which he passed away so uh, his life was getting extended only uh, through the machine 
and uh, uh, after the machine was switched off, after two minutes, the pa uh, pastor and then he kind of uh, kind of uh, kind of justified it by saying that our intention is not to kind of kill the person. Our intention is for the person to live his uh, life uh, according to the karma uh, which is there in the body. The Buddha said that one way of explaining the body is that body is the karma. Is the manifestation of karma. One other way of uh, looking at the body is like the whirlpool which is there. In the, in the uh, lake, there is a whirlpool which is going round and round. This uh, whirlpool is there. It's an entity which is separate from the lake. But the whirlpool which is there is also uh, an entity in itself. But uh, uh, when the energy of that whirlpool is uh, uh, dissipated, then uh, it is only lake is there. So there is no whirlpool. So in the same way, the body is also uh, based on the karma you have done, the body has come. And based on the karma, the body will sustain itself. So uh, uh, whatever uh, is the body's natural uh, life uh, lifespan, it will uh, go through. And uh, a certain uh, there are certain cases where uh, people have been unplugged, but they have not uh, passed away. And they have lived uh, for a long time long time in relative times and uh, they have lived months also so uh, so this is a kind of a way of uh, looking at it one way of look at it yes bandy i'd like to, uh, to pick up uh, on that theme um because modern medical science is now uh, at a place where in people's declining life they can have multiple interventions to extend life. And if we think of their, if we think of their life as, as here, and then it's, 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 it's dropping down and the intervention comes and there's a little blip and then it drops down and another intervention. Is there a place where to, to discuss if the individual, um, whether this intervention is actually useful and helpful um, or whether they, whether they as individuals, you know, it would be more constructive for them to recognize the decline where they are and, and to come to a sense of balance about that decline without this constant and, and repetitive intervention, you know, which is perhaps extending life, um, but it may be extending it beyond what for that individual is a meaningful life. So that is an individual's uh, kind of, uh, uh, it depends because Buddha also praises long life. So mm. uh, one of the blessings the Buddha gives is uh, uh, have a long life. Mm. So the uh, having a long life has certain kind of, I think, uh, importance in uh, developing your wisdom. So uh, when you are living a life which is long, uh, then you understand. And also it becomes a, a kind of a karmic question also of the body. So in this era, our lifetime is 100 years, uh, the Buddha says. If you are going beyond 100 years, you are surely not uh, kind of only waiting for the time to end. It is not a fruitful life you are living, you know, beyond 100. So the Buddha says that this era is uh, of uh, people who live for 100 years. But there are times when uh, people used to live only for 20 years. And then there are times when people uh, live for 60,000 years. 80,000 years, 100,000 years. So it depends on how uh, uh, and which time you are living in. And extending of the time uh, is based on the individual's kind of, I think, choice. Uh, if you want to extend the life uh, by intervention. And normally when you, a person is living, say, a normal life in a village, uh, he has no medical facilities, uh, he lives his life, he has an illness, and uh, he passes away. And it is a natural thing for uh, the people to say that uh, th this person lived his life. He has his children who is kind of carrying a, uh, his name and uh, kind of they dispose of the body. So this is a natural process which is there. But in a modern uh, era, what happens is that uh, they are, uh, there is an identification of certain aspects like uh, the, uh, the body is co considered to be a machine. So they, they say that this uh, chemical uh, formula, which is there, uh, kind of sustains it. So let us give us this uh, chemical to kind of sustain it. So I, I am having a, a, a higher sugar. So I have a, a tablet called metformin. 
that uh, uh, kind of uh, when uh, i take that tablet it kind of interacts it's a chemical it interacts with the body's other chemicals and kind of takes away the sugar uh, excess sugar and it uh, allows the body cell to kind of store excess sh sugar so in this way uh, we i am also kind of uh, in in this process uh, taking a, a conscious decision to kind of uh, intervene in this process so there are other ways of uh, doing that uh, some people kind of uh, do uh, fasting some people kind of uh, go on uh, exercise binges uh, some people kind of uh, have uh, uh, different uh, kind of uh, natural food uh, interventions so those are i think individual uh, people's choice but once a person is uh, uh, essentially not uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, useful or uh, unable to take decisions like a brain dead situation then it is a kind of a gray area and uh, when uh, a life is sustained by machine then uh, we have to kind of ask ourselves that is that person alive or dead just a gray area see one other thing uh, uh, came up uh, there was a group of doctors in thailand they had come up uh, to our monastery in watman anachar and uh, i was kind of attending a senior monk and the, they came and asked the senior monk so uh, they said that uh, we are kind of uh, have a procedure uh, which is uh, kind of taken up in uh, western countries we are kind of uh, importing those procedure that procedure is that once a person in an accident is found we kind of uh, cryogenically freeze that person so there is no pulse so in medical terms they are killing the person then uh, this cryogenically frozen person is flown to a high uh, a, a kind of facility high uh, equipment facility whatever they call it technically that facility they are flown to then after uh, having them flown they kind of uh, defreeze them and they have a higher chance of uh, kind of uh, survival like in uh, uh, princess diana's case uh, the french uh, uh, doctrine of uh, first aid is they stabilize the person where the person has been injured once the person has been stabilized they move the person to the hospital so if the, uh, they they kind of uh, were saying that if the, that uh, procedure was there so uh, princess diana was alive when the uh, paramedics came so they would have frozen the body taken her to the uh, facility and froze her and then uh, uh, kind of uh, attended to her wounds and everything so she would be in a kind of a facility where there would be a lot of intervention possible like uh, 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 lung machine is there heart lung mm -hmm. machine is there and all those functions and then she could have been stabilized and then she could have been given uh, 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 kind of a, uh, intervention uh, to kind of save her life so uh, the chances of uh, uh, not revival uh, uh, or the chances uh, improves overall say if there are 1000 person uh, attended to at the uh, accident site and a thousand persons were froze taken to a high, high uh, kind of uh, uh, this uh, hospital uh, icu hospital and then uh, unfrozen there would be higher percentage who would live so uh, the the monk said that uh, the concept of death uh, is different in uh, kind of uh, the buddha's uh, teaching so that is uh, that uh, uh, when a person is in a cessation what is it saying that vitality is not the, there is heat uh, the, the, uh, there is no vitality uh, there is a the heat is not uh, dissipated from the body there is no vitality and there is no consciousness but the heat has not been dissipated from the body so uh, uh, that heat is considered to be the life force so if the person can be revived then that means that that heat had already, uh, had not dissipated from the uh, this thing the life force had not been dissipated so uh, then it would not be considered to be uh, killing the person if he is being kind of frozen but that is also a gray area because there are not a 100% chance that everybody would revive so there are certain gray, gray areas where we cannot give a uh, kind of a uh, categorical answer but we can kind of give a kind of indication like the story i told you about a senior monk 
he himself was considered uh, i think it is ajan mahabua if i am right you can kind of google it also because that is uh, that is a very famous case uh, ajan mahabua he is considered to be a arahan and he uh, uh, kind of uh, gave the thing that uh, we can uh, with the intention that he continues living as long as his body can support him so he is not living on the support of the machine but he is living uh, on the support of his own uh, faculties so as long as you see again he can do it. yes uh, and what what about the situation where perhaps someone who is ill uh, declines medical intervention which would extend their life so uh, that is a individual uh, this thing but the buddha does not say that uh, uh, that is also a kind of a uh, uh, incorrect uh, uh, answer for oneself so if one uh, a kind of uh, decides for oneself that it is uh, not my time and i will not be able to kind of be uh, useful and wants to kind of continue without medical uh, this thing it is up to the person so there is one case where a monk uh, uh, used to kind of uh, uh, get into the uh, uh, arahant uh, path before fruition uh, his mind used to kind of decline again once again so he used to not be able to keep his uh, mental uh, this thing uh, uh, state uh, uh, and uh, uh, progress towards the arahant level so then uh, uh, he decided to uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 evaluate his situation and he was in a lot of pain and he decided to kind of uh, cut his wrist he knew uh, when his mind was clear and he had uh, attained to fruition uh, that path arahan path and he cut his wrist and uh, he uh, passed away as an arahan so uh, he became an arahan before his body kind of uh, a uh, kind of uh, stop functioning so the buddha uh, 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 the monks come and ask the buddha what is this destination uh, and he says that do you see this dark cloud going around so he said yes uh, we can see this dark cloud so he said this is mara he has come and he is he is kind of confused and he is looking for this person but the person is nowhere to be found because he has become an arahant so in a way uh, that is also kind of a decision uh, it's an independent decision nobody else can take the decision for you in this i i i understand in that situation that that's a a chosen suicide if you like to end your life um but declining declining further medical intervention which might be enormously invasive and uh with a very long recovery period, say, or, or any other any other factors, uh, would would that be considered in the same way to be taking your own life, or are you just allowing the natural process of your body work its way out? See, one way of looking at it, because uh, uh, this uh, requires a high level of uh, technicality. So I I will just say that one way of looking at it is that you are extending your life as long as your body. can sustain it because that is the example of ajan mahabua that was the uh, kind of uh, decision he had taken that uh, the life uh, of the monk who was there was in suffering and uh, uh, he should continue but one other uh, 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 example is of ajan uh, cha ajan cha is also uh, considered to a arhant and to be uh, uh, in a lot of uh, time he was there bedridden and he was on machines uh, many monks uh, who were senior who came and who could read binds uh, say that uh, ajan cha is contemplating on the uh, 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 dependent origination so they they can issue kind of read his mind and say he, his mind is bright now he, his body is not functioning but his mind is bright he is contemplating on the uh, dependent origination so uh, that uh, is also a, a place where uh, they did not kind of uh, stop the medical intervention but for many years kept medical and he was kind of a, a bad ridden in the medical state he had a, a whole putty which was there which was a kind of a mini hospital uh, was dedicated to him uh, and uh, he was kept in that putty for many for a long time 
So that is also uh, an example. So it is a kind of a, I think, uh, where your mind inclines and how you look at it. It, it, it is not a, a, a categorical answers uh, uh, as a monk uh, one is supposed to give. <laughs> Uh, thank you, thank you, Bante, for, for trying to bring some clarity around what is a very complex and, and difficult area. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Bante. Uh, I just want to know, like uh, Bante said, uh, if declining the medical intervention, it depends on the personal view, right? So I just want to know, uh, like. Uh, am I making a right decision to, to do that, like declining uh, medical intervention? I just want to know, uh, is there any degree that uh, this is the right decision or this is not the right decision? No, it depends on the wisdom. See, uh, it depends on one's own uh, karmic uh, accumulation also, one's perspective on life, one develops. That is developed based on uh, the past experiences one has had. In his past, what are the experiences have, uh, one person has, uh, he can uh, makes a decision in the present based on uh, what was there in the past, uh, uh, the decisions he has taken kind of comes up uh, to the uh, person uh, in the present. So uh, it is, uh, there is nothing called right or wrong in that, in that sense. Uh, it is useful or not useful. So the Buddha is also kind of giving the uh, uh, teaching in the sense that it is useful to you or it is not useful to you. So you are not taking in the, there is no absolute rights and wrongs uh, the Buddha is talking about. The Buddha is talking about the direction which you are going. You are going in the useful direction or you are going in the direction of pain and suffering. Or you are ultimately going in a direction where there is <coughs> physical pain, but you are getting away from Dukkha. So uh, that does not mean that if you are in a meditation or if you are in a practice, you avoid all pain. The Buddha uh, very categorically says that if there are this kind of pains, there is heat, there is, uh, uh, there is physical pain, there is uh, bites of uh, mosquitoes, flies, all these things. You have to endure those things. So, uh, and, but you have to avoid the Dukkha, which is the taking of things personally. Uh, saying that this is coming up and this is me, this is mine, this is myself, Get, attaching yourself to those things. So uh, wisdom has to be developed and then wisdom has to be, and if you are not sure of what, what to do, then the uh, Bhante Vimalamsi says that sit in meditation and ask the question to yourself, that what is the right path? Then you uh, kind of depend on your wisdom. Your intuition. Okay. Yeah, interesting. Thank you so much, Bande. Any uh, other question? Uh, last question. Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, I, I'm just curious. Like uh, Bande said that uh, when we do charity or practice generosity, uh, don't suffer yourself. Got it. Uh, uh, why? Because, uh, see, uh, uh, we uh, as an individual uh, also are to take care of ourselves. Because if, if it is a painful for us, okay, then uh, we, uh, what are we uh, likely to do? We are not likely to do something which is painful to us. We do something which is, uh, so when you are doing generosity, is there a joy in your heart? So that has to be there. But also there are practical things that uh, you have to take care of. Okay, so if uh, if there there is a kind of a limited uh, amount of money you have, and if you uh, had to uh, kind of uh, give your brother or uh, your sister or uh, your mother certain uh, medicine, uh, would you uh, rather give that medicine or you would you kind of give it to charity because charity is required because charity can be expressed in other ways. Like I said, generosity can be expressed as a smile. Generosity can be expressed as a kind words. Generosity can be expressed as help, physical help. Like if you uh, go to certain uh, 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 people who are there in your neighborhood who are not able to go to the market, and then they do, I'll, I'll just shop for you. So uh, at, uh, in our uh, town, there are, uh, what happens is there are a lot of people who go to cities 
for working and uh, there are old people living in the house and the market is far away. So there are young people who go and just say, I, I'll buy uh, groceries for you. So they just take a, a, a bag and go and buy groceries for themselves and they buy groceries for the old people and then they just go and give the bags to them. So the, uh, do, doing all these things, I think the sister Kema is there. <laughs> Hello, Sister Kema. I am on the Zoom call. Do you want to come? It is at 3 o'clock. Every, every time. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we are uh, we are there uh, as of now. So you, you want to come? We can answer one or two questions and then we can wrap up. <laughs> uh, yeah, you can come, uh, but I think we, uh, we are almost uh, done uh, because it is already already uh, I think uh, one and a half hours. Okay, you, you just come and we can, uh, or, or uh, maybe we can do this next uh, time, uh, what uh, you had prepared. Are you coming? Hello? Uh, hello, uh, did you hear me? Are you coming? Okay, here come, okay. So, uh, as I was talking about generosity, uh, so generosity is something uh, where uh, you don't have to express that uh, in that terms. But say if uh, it hurts you, then, uh, then those things can be avoided, uh, th those uh, aspects. Okay, am I getting across? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I got it, Bande. But uh, I also, like, long time ago, I heard about uh, the sutta about, I forgot, uh, like, Brahmana, that uh, he did offering one clothes to the king. Like, uh, he think again and again and again, and finally, he sacrificed his clothes to the king and offering to San Buddha. <laughs> To Buddha, I guess. Buddha. And then the yes. king heard that, and the king like award him and his wife like a lot of stuff. Uh, do you know about this? So yeah. in this there case, two, I just want to know. There are two suttas. One sutta, uh, th there is a person, uh, there is a husband and wife. They have only one cloth uh, among themselves uh, to go outside the upper robe. They have the upper robe. There is only one upper robe. So uh, the husband can go out or the wife can go out. The husband goes out. But he is inspired by seeing the Buddha. They don't have children or anything. They, uh, but he is inspired at that time uh, by seeing the Buddha and says that I want to give the uh, dana. And he had a, uh, only one upper row. So that upper row he removed and uh, gave the dana to the Buddha. So when he went back to his house, his field which was there, uh, whatever dirt was there, turned into gold. Uh, so that was the kind of karmic uh, return he got was that he, the field which was there uh, turned into gold. So then he went to the king and said that my field has turned into gold. So the, the, the king said that I'll send men and I'll keep it as a kind of security with me. And I'll, give, I'll provide you with whatever you need. So uh, that, is, that is what... Uh, the story is about that that generosity is based on the inspiration but that is uh, not hurting him so he is not uh, sorrowful uh, uh, for losing that thing because he had that joy of giving so he gave that thing uh, to the this thing there's one story about dalai lama also so there is a old lady uh, who gives the dalai lama a cloth uh, so the, there is a Western uh, person uh, with the Dalai Lama. He says that, uh, why are you taking something from an old uh, poor lady? So uh, the, uh, the, the Dalai Lama says that I am giving her the opportunity to be generous. So that uh, piece of cloth was all she could have offered to the uh, Dalai Lama. And he kind of accepts it, saying that I am giving her the opportunity to be generous. So if I, I kind of deny her generosity, then I will be kind of hurting her feelings. So that would be more bad than not uh, than taking the cloth. 
So that is also uh, uh, the aspect. So uh, as I told you, there are no categorical uh, 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 truths, but they are uh, always directional. If it is useful, it is inspiring, then you do dana. But uh, 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 there are many suttas the Buddha says that how the dana can be categorized. That first is you have to give it to your family, your wife, your ch children, then uh, to your uh, 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 servants and uh, employees, then relatives. So in this way. Thank you so much, Bante. It's really, yeah, I really understand now. Thank you. So it gets it gets kind of it gets it gets kind of fun because um, because um, the Buddha was so specific he didn't leave anything out that was kind of what the I'm glad you chose I don't know what you taught today I, I miss I miss the clock I don't I don't get to out, go out of here ever and someone said I will take you to go for a walk to this place so I went with them and I thought that this started at five o'clock I don't know what happened to my head. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought I was going to be back in plenty of time. But anyway, excuses aside, um, it's amazing to me how the Buddha just covers absolutely everything. And when they say, when people come and they say to me, he's not consistent or something like that, I have to understand immediately they haven't had a chance to really look deeply into many, many suttas. And people take one sutta and say, this is all of all of the story with Buddhism. And you can't do that. Well, why can't you just take it and say Satipatthana Sutta is all you need and it's the whole entire story? Well, <laughs> you can't do it because the Buddha actually, he did have time to do this. I checked this out and I figured it out one winter. I took the time to compute this whole thing. He had the time to teach 20, uh, 24,000 suttas in his lifetime when, in his teaching. 84, and he still, yeah, 24,000 and 2,000 more were taught by the Arahats. But this all had time to take place. I was curious because I thought it was ridiculous to say that somebody could have done that and, and had time to clean their cootie, walk their alms, clean, uh, you know, clean up the refactory, uh, the, clean up the kitchen area and do all the things that monks have to do and, and, and still have time to walk from place to place. So we tried to compute this whole thing to figure out where he went through India with this moving meditation school and how many hours do you think he slept and what did he do in the morning? And we computed the whole thing. Well, at the end of the whole story, I won't go into all the time slots, there was 190,000 hours left when we computed the whole entire thing. And definitely he did have time to teach what they say he taught as well as get everything else done that he was doing. But more than that, he had time to study and we didn't work this in there, but he had time to, to study different aspects of things. And like today's lesson was, what what is a brahmin that was what this lesson was going to be so i guess we can do it next, next time week. next week then. yeah and we we were working it all out and it's one question to the preciseness of saying who is who and uh you know uh you are this and you know, you are that and labeling people and all this stuff about labeling people. And he just went into such amazing detail. But then he went into detail about the Four Noble Truths by itself, or he went into detail about the five aggregates or the kinds of feelings or all these different things. He did leave any stone unturned. If you asked him a question, he would help you. He wouldn't tell you this is how it is. This is what's interesting too. He wouldn't say it's this way and you have to accept it because I say it's this way. He wouldn't do that. And one of the suttas is explaining uh, in the Kalama Sutta, you're not ever supposed to believe what he says. And this Kalama Sutta was not just telling those people uh, not to not to uh, believe something because of what was the way it's written on the broader sense. But when you come back to 
just the Buddha himself, he's saying, don't even believe me. In one of the other suttas, it's basically saying, don't believe me, but I want you to only accept something and say that you believe it if you learned it through knowledge and vision. Well, what is knowledge and vision? Knowing something by seeing it yourself. And he wanted you to discover how everything worked, everything. And he's talking about the arising and passing away of the phenomena, uh, phenomenon that arises and passes away, all phenomena, your whole experience in life, you know? And he's, he's asking you to not accept anything that is described to you or said because somebody said it before or it's been there for thousands of years or anything else not to accept any of it until you actually see it, test it, know it. And then you can say, he's saying, then it's, then it's time to maybe decide, I believe this, I believe that. And, but he's not telling you, you have to do this either, which is kind of cute. He's not saying you have to do this, what I'm saying to you. He's saying, try living this way, try it out for yourself to see whether it's true or not and works or not. I remember one woman approached me once from Burma and she said, well, it has to be true, it's in a book. I said, what? <laughs> and she said, no, it's in a printed book, a published printed book, therefore it has to be the truth. And I was at that time <laughs> considering the Russian, uh, you know, communism and stuff like that at the time. And when I look back and say, you know, uh, the work of the communistic party or this party or that party and thinking it has to be true and it has to be real. And it is so because it is printed in a book. Whoa, that's pretty dangerous. See, so I like the Buddha because he's challenging me. And he's not saying that I'm right and you're wrong. And in all the stories that I found so far of him, when the person comes to him and asks him the question and wants the answer, he doesn't give them the answer per se. He brings them to see the answer themselves. And if they see it, it's fine. In one case, who was the one? Uh, do you remember who it was, You the one? who um, came to him and it said, he, he came to where the Buddha was sitting under a tree and he wagged his tongue like that, you know? And then in the end of that story, he decided- Madhupindika uh, Yeah, who was it? Madhupindika Sutta. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah, and he was, he, was, he was wagging his tail, his tongue and, and saying something to the Buddha and, <laughs> and um, the Buddha explained something to him. Well, in the end of the story, it went back to the first sentence and said, and so he took his staff and pounded it on the ground and was wagging his tongue and he walked away. In that case, the Buddha didn't care. Buddha didn't get upset. Why would he get upset? That was the, uh, it's not for the point of him getting you to agree with him. That's what I like about this whole thing. It's, it's all about testing, learning to test and challenge and see whether it works and what he says is true and it'll help you or not, make you happy. I just got in a cab, I'll tell you this really quick. Mm -hmm. I just got out of the cab coming back here and I was in the cab. First of all, he was very upset that I wanted to sit in the front seat. But I got him through that okay, just laughing and saying, oh, well, I have this neck brace on, you know, and I went, you know, showed him the neck brace and unzipped my collar and said, you know, I have to sit in the front seat. And then, um, and then he was still upset because, uh, yeah, but it's better if you sit, there's more room back there. And we said, no, no, it's okay. But I got in the cab because we were in the process of getting in the cab. So I got in the cab and closed the door. He started to drive. And then he was still a little bit fussy. And then I said, but you know, it's okay. And he looked at me and he said, it is. I said, it is, where are you from? And he told me he was from where the war was. And I said, well, then you see, you're here now and you're happy. When you're happy and you know, we clap your hands. 
and you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Well, he couldn't argue with me anymore. When you're happy and you know it, and you really want to show it, when you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Well, he started smiling and then he started laughing. And then he said, okay, let's go. <laughs> took us back here and he was so happy when I got out of the gap you know he was he said we're happy and he shut the door it was great all you have to do is is smile your way through this whole thing and life is possible that's what I've decided so if they get upset smile you because everything will adjust and it will it will come around and it will work out and that's what people know over here they do they have one million people who arrived here in this city one million people arrived here because of what happened uh with the with the whole war and it happened very quickly but they all are getting along as well as can be expected. And they all are able to adjust themselves. And I think they need to applaud themselves. That's what I told one man. You need to applaud yourself because you're here and you got here and you're alive. And that's the best part, you see? So. So I hope you had a good lesson with Gavesi. <laughs> I'm not sure where this goes. But the Buddha was really detailed. Because my point was he's always detailed. He never leaves anything out. If you look closely enough, it's there. And when you hear this sutta next time, <laughs> uh, when you hear this sutta next time, um, he didn't skip anybody. <laughs> he shows no, yeah, the parts of everything. It's a good example. Okay. We done <laughs> next week. Uh, we have already prepared a sutta. Sister Kema has already prepared a sutta uh, that is uh, Majimanika 98 Vasetta Sutta to Vasetta. So, yeah, finally, she's on time. <laughs> <laughs> finally, three, yeah. uh, three p.m. <laughs> your time. <laughs> okay, so we should okay, say our closing prayer. Okay. May suffering one be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. It's in tune. Okay. <laughs>